If it's Friday, the White House unveils sweeping new sanctions against Russia, and the president pleads with Congress not to abandon Ukraine on the eve of the second anniversary of Putin's brutal invasion. Plus, one day more, former President Trump in position for a runaway victory in tomorrow's South Carolina presidential primary weighs in for the first time on Alabama's frozen embryo ruling as Nikki Haley's campaign dodges questions about how long she can stay in the race if she can't compete on her home turf. And a magician reveals his tricks to NBC News. The exclusive story unmasking the street performer behind that infamous fake Biden robocall in the New Hampshire primary and the Democratic campaign operative who paid him to do it. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington. Tomorrow marks another grim milestone in Ukraine. Two years of fighting back against Russia's brutal invasion. The Biden administration and top Democrats are using this moment to launch a full court press in support of Ukraine and to push House Republicans to vote to get critical aid to the front lines. With military aid stalled and in the wake of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny's death, the White House today announced more than 500 new sanctions on Russia. Now, it's the largest sanctions package since the war began, according to the administration. This morning, President Biden said now is not the time to walk away from Ukraine and once again urged Congress to pass the supplemental and aid bill. And he laid out what's at stake if they fail to do it. You can't walk away now. And that's what Putin is betting on. He's betting on we're going to walk away. History's watching. The clock is ticking. Brave Ukrainian soldiers and civilians are dying. Russia. Russia is taking Ukraine territory for the first time in many months. But here in America, the Speaker gave the House a two-week vacation. They have to come back. They have to come back and get this done. Because failure to support Ukraine in this critical moment will never be forgotten in history. It will be measured. And it will have impact for decades to come. Top five administration officials today also stressing the urgency of this moment. This only underscores the imperative of the House of Representatives passing the supplemental budget request that President Biden has put forward. Uh, this is urgent funding for what Ukraine needs to be able to do to continue to resist, as it's done so effectively, Russia's aggression. We must not grow numb to the plight of the Ukrainian people. There's a phrase I've heard tossed around recently, Ukraine fatigue. The idea that years into this war, our support and attention are faltering. Those Ukrainians, those families who cannot afford to be fatigued are counting on us. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is warning that delays in weapons are making life, quote, very difficult on the front lines, adding that Russia is taking advantage of the situation. Zelensky met with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and a congressional delegation in Ukraine today. In a statement announcing his trip, Senator Schumer vowed he will not stop fighting until Ukraine gets the aid it needs. But right now, two enormous questions remain amid the urging of the White House, of Senate leadership and of leaders around the world. Will the House act when members return to Washington next week? And what happens if it doesn't? Joining me now is NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel in Ukraine. And NBC's Ali Rafa is outside the White House. Richard, I have to start with you because, of course, you were there when the invasion first began two years ago. We all watched your reporting around the clock. How would you compare the situation on the ground right now? Is this a stalemate? Is it Russia who has the momentum? How would you assess what's happening? So it's, it's important to go back to that, that initial moment. Uh, yes, I remember very well uh, that night, that early morning, in fact, it was around 5 o'clock in the morning uh, when the invasion first began. I was in the city of Mariupol, a city which was then taken over by Russian forces in, in a brutal campaign. Uh, they continue to occupy the city to this day, and it's something that Ukrainians want to take back. And those first few days here, 
uh, were incredibly tense. Uh, it looked like uh, Ukraine was going to be wiped off the map. It looked like Russian forces were going to take Kiev. Uh, it looked like the government wasn't going to hold. And by the way, hold. And that was, by the way, the, the expectation of the United States. It was in expectation of uh, the intelligence services of many European countries. But it didn't happen. Uh, the Russian advance was poorly coordinated. It was poorly led. The troops were under-equipped. Uh, the units didn't communicate uh, among themselves. It, it was a, a debacle. And within a few weeks, the Ukrainians, which, who quickly got support from the West, moral support, logistical support, intelligence, weapons, were able to drive the, the Russians back. And that series of successes with one building on the next and there, there were horrors that they discovered along the way as they were driving Russians back. They uncovered mass graves in places like Bucha and Izium. And then about a year ago now, the Ukrainians decided they were going to go for it all and they were going to drive the Russians off their territory and launch a counteroffensive. And that counteroffensive has not been successful. But what it did was burn through an enormous amount of ammunition. Uh, it exhausted a lot of the troops here. And now that counteroffensive, uh, which was supposed to be a summer counteroffensive or spring counteroffensive, has more or less concluded. And the, the Russians are now launching a, an offensive of their own as they're finding the Ukrainians low on ammunition, low on troops, and not being resupplied for uh, by the United States. So aside from that initial window when it looked like the Russians were going to win until it was clear they, they hadn't thought through the assault, I would say this is the weakest time that Ukrainian troops have been uh, except for that, that initial phase. Mm. And, and it is so extraordinary to hear you walk through, Richard, because I remember those moments when officials in Ukraine, when, when officials, frankly, within the Biden administration were expressing concerns that it could fall within just hours and, and they still are there fighting. It's just incredible. And yet you have said there is the possibility that yet another town in Ukraine could be reclaimed or claimed by Russia. What are you hearing about that? What would the implications be? So not just uh, one town. I think you're talking about uh, Chazivyar. It's the town we went to uh, the other day. And I'm, I'm not trying to signal out that town uh, in particular. We went to that town, one, because we've been there several times before. But two, uh, it is right on the front line. And it is not far from Avdivka. And Avdivka was this small city that was taken by, by Russian troops. And now that they've taken Avdivka at great cost to, to the Russian forces, uh, they are spreading out and they are looking for new targets. And Chazivyar is one of them. But it is certainly not the only one. Mm. Uh, the Russians are pushing uh, ahead in the south. They're, they're making advances in the Kherson Zaporizhia area. They're pushing uh, again around Bahmut. They're pushing in many different areas. And uh, the, the concern is, once you start losing territory, and if you don't have the weapons to backfill that territory, and you don't have the, the, the troops to, to, uh, to backfill, then you could start losing more and more, and you could get a, a, a vicious cycle where the Ukrainians really start to lose significant am amounts of territory. And that is why they, they will tell you that there is a timing factor here, that they need supplies quickly uh, before they give the Russians a chance to capitalize on this moment more than they already are. Uh, that said, the Russians also have uh, manpower issues. Uh, they are probably going to have to uh, do another call-up of, uh, of, of Russians. They're going to have to probably mm -hmm. implement a new tighter draft and, and dig, dig deeper into the prison system. Uh, there's talk that they might start recruiting female prisoners as well to add to their, uh, to their ranks. Uh, but, so the Russians are facing problems right now as well. But the big difference is the Russians have, believe it or not, what appear to be more reliable allies in North Korea and Iran supplying them with weapons than Ukraine does with its allies in Europe and the United States. Now that is quite a statement. We will have to see if these gains by Russia that you have mapped out will apply any more pressure on Congress to act. Richard Engel, thank you so much for joining us with your reporting. We know that uh, Ukraine is marking a grim milestone. We really appreciate your bringing it to us.
Ali Rafa, let me turn to you because, as we said at the top of this broadcast, the Biden administration, the president announcing a huge round of sanctions, more than 500 today. But the question is what the question always is, which is why will these sanctions work when, frankly, the rounds of sanctions that have been imposed over the past two years have not deterred Putin? Yeah, Kristen, the U.S. has issued thousands of sanctions against Russia in the last two years, and Russia has been able to work around most of them uh, and, in part, uh, help and boost their own economy. And there, that led to some serious concerns over whether this new round of sanctions would be mostly bark and no bite. But it looks like from the uh, layout that we're seeing by the Biden administration of what specific targets uh, are included in these sanctions that they have thought of that and it encompasses a wide swath of targets some of these are uh, targeting people and entities businesses companies inside and out of Russia uh, that have evaded sanctions that the US has issued in the past they also target these companies and people who have bolstered Russia's uh, energy industry uh, Russia's industrial uh, uh, industry also its financial industries all of that feeding Russia's warm machine. There are also sanctions focused on o Russia's oil revenues. In just the last few minutes, the Treasury Department announced a new set of sanctions against Russia's largest shipping companies aimed at uh, preventing those oil revenues from getting even higher. So officials are saying that they expect concrete results from all of this, but not in the short term. This is uh, meant to uh, slowly squeeze Russia of these resources, to slowly be able to chip away at their capability. And then, of course, there are some uh, sanctions uh, more to send a message, like what we saw with uh, the several people that were directly involved in Alexei Navalny's death being targeted today as well. All right. Ali Rafa at the White House, thank you so much. I now want to bring in Bill Taylor, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and vice president for Europe and Russia at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Ambassador Taylor, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. As I was discussing with Richard, this is a grim milestone. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Kristen. I wonder if we can start off by just getting your assessment of what you are seeing happen on the battlefield. As Richard is saying, Russia obviously has just claimed that one major city in the east. It is looking to claim other territories in that region. Does Russia have the momentum right now? I wouldn't say it's momentum, but they do have the initiative, Kristen. You're exactly right. Um, they are taking advantage of the constraints that the Ukrainians feel and have to deal with on their weapons, on their ammunition, on their artillery, on their air defense. The Ukrainians know that there is a pause, that there, there is a gap um, in the funding that is, a, that is requiring the U.S. to slow down its deliveries. And so when that happens, they, the Ukrainians don't want to run out. So they have, to, they have to rein back, they have to pull back on how much they fire. So this is clearly having a good effect, and we see it in Avdivka. It's just as Richard said, they are, the Russians are going to take advantage um, in other parts of the line. It's a long line. It's a long the line of contact is 900 kilometers, 600 miles, um, and the Russians are pushing in several different places. So they're definitely taking advantage of what they see as a pause in what the United States is able to provide. What do you make, Ambassador Taylor, of this new round of sanctions? You just heard my colleague Ali Rafa map those out. More than 500, clearly a significant number, which are targeting entities and also individuals. And the expectation is that they will start to have a bite in the long term. But what are the expectations in the short term? In the short term, the sanctions, just as you just said and as Ali just said, the, sh the sanctions are not short term effects. What is short term effect are weapons that we just were talking about. These sanctions that, uh, that are laid out today, they're designed to kind of plug loopholes. There are a lot of sanctions, as Ali said, a lot of sanctions already on the books and already in effect, but people have figured out, nations have figured out, traders have figured out how to get around these sanctions. So some of the sanctions rolled out today are to plug those loopholes. There's another big one, Kristen, that we haven't talked about mm -hmm. yet that it could come, which is to seize this $330 billion of, of assets, Russian central bank assets, that could be used then for the Ukrainians, for to keep them going, weapons, but also for reconstruction. Mm. 
We are at this moment where we're marking the, this two-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it comes, uh, yes, against this debate over whether Congress should send more aid. It comes as the opposition leader, Putin's top opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, has just died. President Biden laying the blame squarely at the feet of Vladimir Putin. And yet you hear a number of skeptical lawmakers, many of them Republicans, saying we can't continue to send more aid to Ukraine. Do you think this moment, the death of Navalny, the fact that here we are at two years, will that be enough pressure to get Congress to act? What is your assessment here? My sense is it will be. I mean, for all the reasons that you just said. And the Republicans and Democrats came together in the Senate, 70 to 29. You don't get many of those 70 to 29 votes in the Senate. Um, and that's what would, can happen on the House floor. It will be at least that, that same kind of Republicans and Democrats, a big majority that will pass this bill if it can get to the floor. And that's the, that's the question. And Kristen, there are a lot of people who care a lot about this, understand stakes. And, they're, and the members of the House on the Republican side and Democratic side who are looking for different ways to bring it to the floor, I think they will succeed. All right. Well, we're going to continue to watch it closely. Thank you for being here, Ambassador Bill Taylor, to help us mark this milestone. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your insights. Later this hour, I will have a one-on-one -on -one interview exclusively the UK Foreign Minister David Cameron, who's warning the world not to repeat the, quote, weakness displayed against Hitler when it comes to Putin and Russia. You don't want to miss that conversation and his stern words. But first, tomorrow is the South Carolina Republican presidential primary and we're live in the palmetto state as nikki haley braces for a potential blowout on her home turf stay with us you're watching meet the press now welcome back in less than 24 hours voters will be voting in south carolina as donald trump and nikki haley go head to head in haley's home state the former president is ahead by double digits in all the polls, while largely shunning events on the ground until the last moment. These are live pictures where we're expecting him to address the crowd any moment at a rally in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Very different story for Nikki Haley. She's been all over the state trying to make the case to primary voters that she is the stronger general election candidate. Haley has vowed to stay in the race even if she loses, leaving her campaign focusing its attention on something it can beat expectations. Take a listen. They said we wouldn't make it to Iowa, and we came within 1% of second place. Then they said on the day of New Hampshire, we were down 30 points in the polls. We got 43% of the vote. This is the time South Carolina can really step up and show the direction that we want our country to go in. NBC's Ali Vitale is on the ground for us in South Carolina. Ali, you, of course, have been able to interview Nikki Haley this week. Talk about the strategy heading into this home stretch. They're really trying to manage expectations, aren't they? Look, they've been very deft at managing expectations, Kristen. I think you and I both have done various interviews with the candidate and, of course, with the campaign, talking about what it means to win there from their perspective. And they've not said that they plan to win in South Carolina. Certainly the polls tell that story as well. Trump is far out ahead in most of the polls that we've seen. But over the course of the last few weeks, what we have seen from Haley is her set the expectation that she can at least do better here than she did in New Hampshire. The electorate here is, of course, very different. That New Hampshire electorate full of way more independent voters. That's the kind of coalition that the Haley campaign has said they think they can build on. But here in South Carolina, we have seen Haley take a really tough tone against her chief rival, former President Donald Trump. Of course, Trump giving it right back to her. But on the airwaves here and of course at campaign events, Haley has made the consistent argument that electability is the reason that she is the best positioned to take on Joe Biden in a general election. She keeps hammering that message and certainly there are some polls that bear that out that a general election of Haley versus Biden would be far more competitive for Republicans in a positive sense than it would be if it was Trump versus Biden again polls show that that's really a toss-up at least right now at this early point but the thing for Haley is you've got to get through a primary if you want to get through a general and South Carolina is really a state 
where compared to when she was on the ballot last time around many years ago for her gubernatorial bid, this is an electorate that has changed. It has grown in size, but it's also a place where it really is presumed to be Trump country, an example of the ways that Trump has changed what it means to be a Republican in this current moment where he is vying once again for re-election. You're absolutely right, and there's no way to sugarcoat it, Allie. Even if she manages expectations, yeah. a loss in her home state would be a tough one. Ali Vitali, thanks so much for your great reporting. Appreciate it. Joining me now is Caton Dawson. He's the former chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party, and he is supporting Nikki Haley in tomorrow's contest. Thank you for coming back and joining us on the eve of the primary. We really appreciate it. What a privilege and pleasure being with you today, Kristen. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a tense time in South Carolina. The elections have already started. Uh, we, we had two weeks of early voting, and to give you an example, 205,000 uh, voters walk through the walk through the first chance to ever have early voting in a presidential primary here. Uh, those are encouraging numbers. I, I, I'm looking at the counties now. Let me give you a comparison. 740,000 voted in 2016. Trump captured 32.5 percent. Rubio and Cruz captured together 44 percent. So uh, Donald Trump got 241,000 to head himself towards winning the nomination in 2016. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're cautiously optimistic with Team Haley. She, she's run a tougher race. She knocked out 12 of the fellers, as she would say. <laughs> he's got one left to go do. Uh, Donald Trump gave us a couple of gifts along the way, uh, Christian, and one of them was when she attacked her husband. The other one was, was a commercial that's running that's doing real well, where Donald Trump calls people who have served in the military and who have died and who have been captured losers and didn't understand what was in it for him. Well, there is a cemetery about every four miles in South Carolina mm. with military people that have been buried, that have fought wars from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War, World War I, World War II. My father, who was World War II veteran, came home with a Nazi bullet in his left leg, yeah. went to Korea, shrapnel in his right hip, would be offended at the way Trump has treated the military. So that opened the door. Yeah, I do, you do, you and I talked about this before. Donald yeah. Trump has the luckiness of every time he's been indicted, his numbers have increased. Mm -hmm. I know that's odd. I know that's weird, but it's a fact. So we're fighting uh, an uphill battle, but I think we're going to exceed expectations. All of our team has encouraged Governor Haley to move forward and head towards Michigan and Super Tuesday. Uh, we'll, we'll move out of the South and come back, but but we have certainly encouraged her to keep, to carry on the fight. Let me let me ask you about the expectations that have been set. And look, Nikki Haley seems to be shifting the goalposts a little bit. Here is what she told me on Meet the Press on January 28th. Take a look. You were governor in the state of South Carolina. Do you need to win your home state in order to stay in this race? Is it do or die? I think I need to do better than I did in New Hampshire. So this is a building situation. So she says she needs to do better in New Hampshire. Now she's saying she's going to keep fighting until the American people, quote, close the door. What message does it send that she's shifting her own goalposts, Caton? Well, we, we, you know, what we didn't think was that Donald Trump would be seen as an incumbent. I mean, he lost. He lost in 2020. He lost again in 20. Yeah, when you take a look at it, he lost again in 2018. But 2020, what about the fact that she's shifting her own expectations? She told me she needed to do better than she needs to do in New Hampshire. Does she need to do better than she did in New Hampshire to stay in this race beyond South Carolina, do you think? We have the money, we have the passion, and we have the right to say that three states can't pick a nominee. That's what we'd have the right to do. We'll see. I'm encouraged by this early voting, Kristen. I'm encouraged. I think we're going to do about 950,000 people. That's a lot more than we had in 16. Nikki seems to get a good chance to the new. And Nikki wants a bigger Republican Party. Donald Trump needs a smaller Republican Party. No question he's got a firm grip on 41% of the vote. Firm yeah. grip. Yeah. We, we've seen that the whole time. We've seen ebb and flow in the others. So, you know, we're the outsider again, even though she's the former governor of the state of South Carolina, the first woman, especially minority woman, what? ever to be elected to that yeah. position in our state. So... We're selling everything let, we've got uh, let, for, I think yeah. it's monumental. She can do wonders for just the attitude Kayden, in America. Yeah, let me ask you just very quickly, because we're just about out of time here. What states can she win if she doesn't win South Carolina? What happens after South Carolina? Where do you think she has a shot 
at actually winning. Well, we can Utah. That's one. Um, uh, Michigan, another. Pick one or two out of the out of the, out of the uh, pick some out of the uh, uh, the next big states there. And if we she's still trailing them. after Super Tuesday, does she need to basically say, okay, that's it? Well, we'll have to count the delegates and see. But I, I, I you know. A lot of people are putting pressure on to get out. The more yet more we get pushed, the harder we want to stay. I mean, this is the contest is down to two, Kristen. I mean, we we've got we can we're we're tough South Carolinians. We've been in every major fight this country's ever had, and we're not gonna give up that easy with somebody we're pretty convinced, Kristen, is gonna lose in the fall. All right. Well, Kate and Dawson, I always enjoy our conversations. I hope you'll come back. We'll be watching tomorrow real closely. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate being here. Great home. to see you. NBC News Now will have live coverage and analysis of the South Carolina primary tomorrow. I will be joining my colleague Hallie Jackson for special coverage, which starts at 6 p.m. Eastern right here on NBC News Now. Up next, former President Trump responds to that first of its kind Alabama Supreme Court ruling on embryos. His message and why it matters. The panel's next. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Turning now to new developments in the ongoing saga over Alabama's Supreme Court ruling that frozen embryos are children, which has led fertility clinics in the state to halt treatment due to potential legal liability. The White House is now discussing possible legal and policy options to respond, according to administration officials. The efforts involve the Departments of Justice and Health and Human Services. The one source cautions there is limited power to issue any executive action to protect IVF. Meanwhile, six days after the decision came down, Republican frontrunner Donald Trump is reacting for the first time on social media, writing, quote, I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious baby. Today, I am calling on the Alabama legislature to act quickly to find an immediate solution to preserve the availability of IVF in Alabama. It comes as Republicans seek to stave off any political blowback from the decision as the party tries to navigate a broader 2024 message on reproductive rights. Joining me now is the panel, Julia Manchester, national political reporter for The Hill, Simone Sanders Townsend, co-host of The Weekend on MSNBC, and Pete Seat, Republican strategist and former White House spokesman under President George W. Bush. Thank you all for being here. Julia, what do you make of this IVF discussion? And frankly, former President Trump now weighing in, saying that he opposes this, that actually the state legislature needs to act. Yeah, Kristen, Republicans are really under pressure here. You know, I was at CPAC earlier this week and yesterday I spoke with Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville, mm -hmm. and it was interesting to see his reaction. <laughs> it started out with, I'm all for it. Then we asked him, you know, is a child, an, em an embryo a child? Yes, it is. Then it says, okay, do you agree with the decision? I haven't read it. It's a state decision. So they are being put in a bind. You saw Nikki Haley walk back her comments on this, and it's really interesting because I've had Democratic sources tell me really ever since Roe versus Wade was overturned that the next step in this fight in terms of reproductive rights would be IVF, and here we are. Here we are. Pete, what do you make of what you heard from former President Trump and what Julia is speaking to, the fact that Nikki Haley came out? Mm -hmm. Look, she says she was speaking personally when she said embryos are children. She has struggled with infertility. Anyone who struggled with infertility can understand where and why she would say something like that. And yet, from a policy perspective, it gets very complicated. So she wound up walking back those comments. Yeah, Republicans should not be in a bind on this issue. As the National Republican Senatorial Committee put out in a memo to all their candidates, 85% of the American people support IVF. 85%. Yeah. There are few issues close. in this world <laughs> where 85% of Americans are on the same page. Now, the problem for Republicans on this and other issues is when we're explaining, we're losing. And that's the position that we find ourselves in right now. They need to be forceful. They need to be proactive. And they need to continue doing what former President Trump did today to say, yes, we support IVF and we will pose restrictions on it. Simone, it was so interesting because everyone was saying Trump hasn't weighed in, he hasn't weighed in. He actually 
waited, but when he did weigh in, as Pete is making the argument, he came down on the side of where the majority of people are on this argument. You have the vice president who wasted no time getting out there, bashing this decision, making the broader argument the Democrats stand for reproductive rights. Politically speaking, how does the IVF piece of this play in 2024 for President Biden? Look, I think the IVF piece is actually really important here, and it speaks to the broad... This goes all the way back to Dobbs, right? If you read the, the majority opinion in the Dobbs decision, it, Alito repeatedly underscores the life of an unborn child, right? And many amicus briefs that were filed in that uh, Dobbs before in the Dobbs case said that this is going to affect IVF contraception down the line. Well, you've got bills in the United States Congress like um, the what is the bill called? The Life at Conception Act, mm. right? Okay. Well, do you believe conception is? IVF, when the embryo, is, when when the egg becomes an embryo, when it's fertilized, because if so, then are you supportive of IVF? You see what I'm saying? Like it gets a little it's murky. It's a slippery slope. It's a very, it's a slippery, very slope. slippery slope. And so while I agree that the 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 language that uh, former President Trump used strong, the language in the memo from the Republican Senate mm -hmm. kept strong, but the language is not matching the policies. And so I am hearing what you're saying, but I'm also seeing what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, Pete, this is the, the patchwork of policies that now exist in the post Roe era. Now we're dealing with IVF, but on reproductive rights writ large. And, and when you talk to Republicans and in my conversations, they acknowledge it's a challenge because there's no unified message. There's no unified policy. There's no unified approach. And in fact, former President Trump now privately saying, yes, he supports a 16 week ban. I'm told he's not going to come out and announce that immediately. But it sounds like that's where he's going to end up. What do you make of that? Well, I, I want to go to what you were saying, Simone, because this is a, a moral conundrum. And it is not a conversation that I think this country is ready for right now. Mm. We can't have a nuanced conversation like the one you were proposing because everything is far too politicized. Mm. I mean, we just saw this with this is the Alabama Supreme Court has nothing to do with the U.S. Senate, has nothing to do with the U.S. House of Representatives. But immediately, every Republican in the country, from those running for president to those running for county commissioner, are painted with the brush that they are opposed to IVF when that's not the case. I mean, it's a valid question, though, to ask. And I, I think a question, a nuanced conversation, it, this, these are just the facts. The bill that I talked about, the Life of Conception Act, 125 House Republicans support that bill. Mm -hmm. The Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, supports that bill. That same speaker said when he went to testify before the Texas uh, State House, State Legislature, was talking about their six-week ban, he said that he believes there's a full human being from the moment of fertilization. He said that in 2021. Mm -hmm. And so I understand Stand the lack of nuance. I wish we could have more nuanced conversations, but the facts are yeah. that the the writ large Republican Party apparatus, what they are saying about what they believe and the policies that they are supporting are not matching up. So if people really believe what they said in these statements about IVF, I think the follow-up is, well, 125 yeah. House Republicans, do you still support the Life at Conception Act? Yeah. And I don't Ju disagree with that. Julia, this is the backdrop as we head into South Carolina tomorrow. And again, that Nikki Haley has spent a lot of this week, Pete talks about it, explaining. Yeah. She has done a lot of explaining mm -hmm. in the wake of those comments. She's already trailing former President Trump by 30 points in some polls. She says she's in this to win it. Uh, but donors are going to start to get jittery here, are they not? They are, but I thought it was interesting. Earlier today, Nikki Haley's campaign announced a seven-figure national and digital ad buy that will run at least until Super Tuesday. She's hiring staff or appears to be putting teams together in Super Tuesday states and beyond. So I guess donors still want that never-Trump or anti-Trump voice. But at the same time, I think it all comes down to the delegate math. She, mm -hmm. Can she get enough delegates after Super Tuesday? And I think the fact of the matter is we are seeing that Republican primary voters seem to be coalescing around Donald Trump. We'll see what happens later. But right now, he is the seen as the front runner. What do you think, uh, Simone, put your political analyst hat on. What do you think her calculus is to stay in this race? Is it to make the anti-Trump argument? I Maybe so. Look, I, I think Mickey Haley is where Bernie Sanders was in 2015, uh, 2016, and I was there. And, <laughs> and he was staying in that race until every voter had their chance to have their say and didn't want to deny the people that wanted to vote for him the opportunity. I think that's what Mickey Haley is doing. And in that, she may garner some delegates, but the way in which the math is happening and the way in which the state parties are set up now in this particular primary, it's winner take all. So she must win one 
to get some. She's got to right. Yeah. She's, that's a good statement. I'm going to keep that in my mind. Pete, the big question is, will she or won't she, if and when she does drop out, endorse former President Trump? If, I've been told, look, if she has any hopes for 2028, she's got to. Yeah, I think that's why she's still in this race, is 2028. She is thinking much longer term than most anyone else does, uh, because she wants to be that anti-Trump, post-Trump candidate. She's hoping that she can earn some goodwill through this process build infrastructure in states around the country, and then flip that switch when the time comes. All right. Great conversation, you guys. Thank you so much, Julia, Simone, and Pete. And coming up after the break, we've got some really fascinating NBC News exclusive reporting revealing who made that infamous fake robocall of President Biden telling New Hampshire voters not to vote in the state's primary. And which campaign operative was behind it? We'll explain. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We want to turn now to some incredible reporting from my NBC News colleague, Alex Seitzwald, and a story you have to see to believe. It involves what up until today was a major mystery in the Democratic presidential contest. Who created that bogus robocall with President Biden's voice that appeared out of thin air, telling people not to vote in the New Hampshire primary? The incident just enraged local election officials and Biden allies quickly became the subject of a multi-state law enforcement investigation. But NBC's Alex Seitzwald is now revealing who's behind the curtain. As Alex reports, the call was the work of a Democratic consultant who was working for Biden's primary rival, Democratic Congressman Dean Phillips. Financial records show a Phillips campaign staffer paid this man, John Carpenter, a New Orleans magician, with no fixed address, Carpenter walked NBC News through how he made the recording using readily available artificial intelligence software. He says he basically pulled it out of his hat in less than 20 minutes using software that cost him, get this, $1. The Phillips campaign condemned the staffer who allegedly paid for the call and said they may pursue legal action against him. Joining me now is the reporter who broke this incredible story, my NBC News colleague, Alex Seitzwald, it's great to see you, Alex. So, Alex, walk us through your reporting. This is incredible. It was a magician, which seems somewhat apt for this story that appeared <laughs> out of thin air. It is one of those stranger-than-fiction uh, stories, Kristen. Uh, and this all started with an anonymous email about a week ago, the kind that you know you and I and many reporters receive all the time and often ignore. And this time I decided to play along. Uh, the subject line was just robocall creator and got on the phone with this guy who was clearly eccentric. But the more he started talking, the more I started to think he had something real to say. And then he produced receipts, uh, like you said, Venmo transactions, text messages, call logs, and the original audio that he made of the uh, fake, the, the, the Biden deep fake. And then we were able to confirm it through some other uh, independent methods too. And the person who he says paid him, um, a consultant named Steve Kramer, did not deny this uh, mm. and is planning to reveal his side of the story later. I'm hoping to interview him uh, and also in an op-ed. So uh, answer those anonymous email tips that sometimes uh, come into your <laughs> inbox. I, I will. I mean, that that's a pretty remarkable one, Alex. I have to say, it's a great story. Thank you for peeling back the curtain and telling us how you actually got it. How, what did he explain to you about how he actually made the robocall? And, and apparently the Phillips campaign is condemning the work of this staffer. Yeah, so uh, I had broken the original story of the robocall along with our colleague Mike Memoli, which is why he reached out um, to me, and he showed us how he made it. He says that he had no idea uh, that the person who paid him was working for the Phillips campaign. He thought that everything was above board, uh, but the Phillips campaign essentially says that this contractor, Steve Kramer, went rogue. Um, even though he, you know, he's paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars in December and January by the campaign, but it was for ballot access work in two states, and that's it. Um, and they say they have no knowledge and didn't direct him to do this. And, and I have nothing uh, to contradict this. So it, it's certainly a big headache uh, for the Phillips campaign, and not a way that they want to be uh, making news, even though mm. it's unclear if they actually had any role in this. Wow. Alex Seitzwald, just an incredible piece of reporting. Thank you so much for bringing it to us. And it's always great to see you. Really appreciate it. And you can get more of Alex's reporting on this incredible story in today's issue of the NBC News Politics Newsletter from the Politics Desk.
And still to come, ahead of the two-year anniversary of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, my one-on-one -on -one interview with UK's Foreign Secretary and former Prime Minister David Cameron about what the U.S. and the world should be doing right now to help Ukraine. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we mentioned at the top of our show, tomorrow will mark two years since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine. Earlier today, I spoke with David Cameron, the former British Prime Minister, now UK's Foreign Secretary. I began by asking him about his assessment of the war and whether this is now a stalemate or does Russia have the upper hand? Look, of course, it's a, it's a difficult situation uh, on the ground. We can see that. But Russia's lost probably 300,000 troops. It's been a massive miscalculation by Putin. And I think at the two-year mark, what we ought to be doing is rededicating ourselves to helping Ukraine and making sure Putin doesn't win, because that's so important. It's not just grain security or, or Europe security. I think it's, it's crucial for the U.S.'s security, too. How big of a setback, though, Mr. Foreign Secretary, was the fall of that eastern city? And, and does the United States bear some responsibility right now? Aid to Ukraine is being held up in Congress. Well, obviously, the loss of any territory for Ukraine is, is, is bad because they want to recover the territory that Putin took in his illegal and aggressive invasion. And I think what that tells a story of is that while a lot of support is being given to Ukraine and Britain has played its part, you know, the first to give long-range artillery and anti-tank weapons and tanks and all the other things, we're not doing enough, all of us are not doing enough to give Ukraine the simple shells they need. They need... 6,000 a day. They're only getting 2,000 a day. And we've got to fix that. I do want to ask you about something you wrote in an op-ed earlier this month about the stalled U.S. foreign aid bill here in the U.S. You say, I'm going to drop all diplomatic niceties. I urge Congress to pass it. I believe our joint history shows the folly of giving in to tyrants in Europe who believe in redrawing boundaries by force. I do not want us to show the weakness displayed against Hitler in the 1930s. That is incredibly strong language. Why was it important for you to write this? Well, because I think it's true. I think what happened in, uh, in 1938 when Hitler took effectively took Czechoslovakia, the world, instead of responding, said, let's, uh, you know, let's discuss this and let's uh, try and find a, a, another answer. That's how appeasement was born. And I think we are in danger of making the same mistake here. If you go back in just recent history, Putin took a, uh, a slice of Georgia in 2008. He took a slice of Ukraine in 2014. And now he's come back two years ago and tried to take the whole country. And I think we've seen the evidence that he will always come back for more unless we stop him. Now, what's happening is the Ukrainians are stopping him. And, you know, it's been a small investment by the United States. Perhaps, you know, 5 or 5% 5 of your defense budget has basically knocked out half of Putin's pre-war military capacity and half of his tanks. It's been an incredible investment for the United States without the loss of a single U.S. Uh, life. So the lessons from history are there. If you don't stop dictators in Europe that try to invade other countries, it ends very badly. That was the lesson of the 30s, and that's why I said that in that article. Well, let's delve into the arguments we're hearing here in Washington a bit. Republicans say that Congress should not be writing a blank check to Ukraine because they say they're not clear of what President Zelensky's ultimate strategy is. Do you have a clear sense of President Zelensky's strategy? And what's your message to those holdouts, Mr. Foreign Secretary? Uh, what I would say to the holdouts is, first of all, I think the Ukrainians do have a very clear strategy. They want their borders and their country and their sovereignty to be respected, as, as we all would. I mean, nothing matters more if you're a citizen of the United States or a citizen of the United Kingdom, is the idea that someone could come along, invade our country, take some of our territory and get away with it. We would find that appalling. Now, all Ukraine is trying to do is get back the country, uh, get back the territory that it has and then live in peace with its neighbors. They're doing the fighting. They're being incredibly brave. I don't have any doubt about their resolve, and we should be helping them to do that. And to people in American politics, I quite understand you've got big issues to deal with about you know, industry and about the border and immigration and all those things. But actually, this is a, a minor investment for the United States, uh, helping a country that wants to recover its own territory. And 
doing so in a way that will stop a dictator in its tracks. And again, from history, we know that when we don't back people early on, it costs far more when eventually we do have to go in and put a stop to a dictator intent on taking other people's countries. It costs us more in, in, in actual lives and it costs us more in money. So this is the right investment at the right time, backing the right country that's doing the right thing. Do you think there's more that President Biden can be doing unilaterally? For example, should he be working with the Pentagon to be sending more long range missiles and weaponry to Ukraine? I, I think that would be very positive. I think what, um, what Britain has shown, I'm not saying we get everything right, we make mistakes, but right at the start of this conflict, we took the view we were going to back Ukraine and back Zelensky as much as we could. So we gave them the anti-tank weapons, we gave them the tanks, we gave them the long range artillery, and on every occasion, there were people saying, including some of the United States, saying, look, this is in danger of escalating. And I don't think it was in danger of escalating the conflict. What we were doing was giving Ukraine the weaponry they need to fight off the Russians. And I think that is non-escalatory. I think it's perfectly fair to back a country in its self-defense. And I think that the more that the American administration can see that that's, that, that works, that, that others have done it, America is doing it now with the long-range artillery, and I would urge the Pentagon and the President to you know, err on the side of doing more. Let's not give Ukraine just enough to stay in the fight. Let's give them enough to take the fight to the Russians, to show Putin he can't win. Let's make sure that Crimea, which is part of Ukraine, is under threat from the Ukrainian army. Let's help the Ukrainian Navy with the incredible job they've done about pushing the Russian Navy back across the Black Sea. That is helping a country defend itself. It's not escalating the conflict. I want to ask you now about this tragic death of Alexei Navalny. You obviously have been at the G20 foreign ministers meeting. Sergei Lavrov also attended that summit. There are reports that you confronted him directly, that you said you that Russia is responsible for Navalny's death. Can you share with us what was your direct message to Lavrov? I, I did say that. I mean, I said that, you know, the example I gave was that, you know, the, the, the Russians started this war claiming that they needed to denazify Ukraine, which was always nonsense. It was just a war of aggression. And I made the point that the people behaving like Nazis are actually Putin and his henchmen who think they can invade another country, take its territory, and the world will look away and let them get away with it. And also the way that they are, uh, frankly, you know, killing people in their own country who dare to stand up to Putin and who dare to point out the corruption he's responsible for and the lack of democracy they have in that country, that they are responsible for those things, not just in their own country, but we also see around the world how they, you know, sent their assassins to poison people, whether in the United Kingdom or elsewhere. These are the acts of a deeply dictatorial and unpleasant regime. And all the while we say this, we should remember the quarrel is not with the Russian people. The quarrel is with Putin and his henchmen who behave in this terrible way. And we should hold them to account, which is why the president's sanctions and the sanctions that we put in place earlier this week are so welcome. I'd like to ask you about the Republican frontrunner. Uh, former President Donald Trump has has compared his legal challenges to uh, the persecution of Navalny. He also recently said that he would not protect NATO countries who did not meet their financial obligations to the alliance, that he would, in fact, encourage Russia to invade. What is your reaction to hearing these comments? How have other NATO countries responded? <clears throat> Well, I want to be very careful not to intervene uh, in your politics, in your democracy. America's a great democracy. You have these great elections. The, the British will always work with whoever is the president and work with whoever is in Congress because we have an incredibly close partnership that goes back such a, such a long time. I think the only point I'd make is that when I look at what's happened to NATO is it's got so much stronger. So I think America can look at NATO and feel confidence that the Europeans are pulling their weight. It is getting stronger. It's the most successful defensive alliance in history. And we should be backing it and believing in it. Uh, and I, I hope that goes for all sides of the aisle. Foreign Secretary David Cameron, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your critical perspective with us. We really appreciate your joining us today.
Thank you very much. And you can see more of my interview with the foreign secretary, including what he has to say about the war in Gaza and the possibility of a hostage deal on our website at meetthepress.com. We will be back Monday with more Meet the Press now. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press on your local NBC News station. I'll have exclusive interviews with Governor Gavin Newsom and Congressman Byron Donalds, plus National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. You don't want to miss it. The news continues with my friend Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.